Hey there. So I've gotten some questions recently about God's provision and finances. Um, things have been stressful for people money wise. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I've been considering how to address it. Somebody asked me to do a video about it and it's like, I've had to gather my thoughts. Um, and I think I just need to speak from my own experience. Uh, you know, when I got saved, I was, I, I got, I got freaked out. I got, I had a paradigm shift. I dropped out of college, uh, because I thought Jesus was coming back. This is in the, like 1994, uh, 93. Um, and I couldn't stop talking about him. And on the one hand, that was a good thing. On the other hand, uh, all my papers at school were full of... <laughs> You know, Israel's gathered back into the land and Jerusalem has become a cup of trembling and blah, blah. you know. Uh, I mean, whether it was a music theory class or an ethics class, it didn't matter. That's what I was doing. And eventually, I started to realize, I'm people think I'm crazy, you know. I don't fit here. So I quit school. And I'd never even really had a job other than being a musician, uh, in bands and stuff, you know, and, uh, at the time I was living with my girlfriend, um, I, I'd run away from home pretty much, uh, had nowhere to go, no money was, we were mutually dependent on each other financially. We had, uh, just all kinds of financial problems. I mean, for us, Paying a water bill was a big deal. You know, paying our bills on time didn't happen. It was always a matter of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Everything was on credit cards. Our debt was pretty out of control. Uh, and, you know, we, <laughs> we didn't make any good financial decisions. And we were living together and we were... It was just a mess. And we couldn't separate. We ended up getting married... Because, well, we're Christians and we have to do that, you know. Which probably wasn't advisable, honestly. And it turned out I was married to a compulsive shopper. Um, eventually, I got an IT job and started making okay money. Uh, but all the money went out. She would go to Goodwill or a thrift store and spend $50 and then go reward herself with a credit card for saving, for being thrifty by going to Nordstrom, Dillard's, Macy's, uh, the spa, <laughs> uh, and she'd spend $600, $700 at, you know, all at once. Uh, she'd come home, you know, I mean, she, and she had a, she, she did this for years where it was impossible to have any control over finances. No matter how much I, m money I made, it was all gone. Um, but I went to one of those churches that teaches sowing and reaping and tithing. And so I just gave everything I could and, uh, stressed about money a lot, but thought, well, if I give, God will give to me. And, but I had all kinds of condemnation because we were such bad stewards of money and I had all these financial problems. And I didn't quite really understand my standing before God like I do today, that I'm justified by faith. And when it came to money, I kind of thought you had to merit his blessing. Really, when it came to anything, I thought you had to merit his blessing, but money especially because of the teaching. Uh, so I gave and gave and gave and gave, you know. Anytime there was a chance, I would give, uh, thinking there's going to be a miracle, you know. Uh, I need a miracle, <laughs> And then when my dad passed away, I had an inheritance uh, that allowed me to clean up all my debt. Uh, it wasn't that much. I mean, it was just, it was, I sold his house, and once I paid the debts on that, I had a little left over, and I was able to pay off our debt and also pay off my car, which was the first time I'd ever been debt-free, you know. Within two or three weeks, I wrecked the car, totaled it. It was a Honda Accord, uh, 
which I couldn't afford anyway on my own. You know, we were just hemorrhaging money. And the thing is, is, you know, because, because money was such an exercise in futility, you just bought things when you could and put it on credit and said, I'll figure it out later. Our finances were just a mess. And it didn't matter how much money we made. It was all gone. And I was always stressed about money. And at the time that, you know, my dad passed, I had a, a job working in IT where I was making like 60000 I think more. It was like seventy. you know. This is, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, that was good money at a solid job, which I hated. <laughs> I felt so trapped. Because I couldn't quit the job uh, because that's how I was paying for my home, just barely. Uh, and we were, no matter how much money we had, it was all gone. Oh, so that inheritance. I, I did pay off my debt, but wrecked that car. And then my wife spent the rest of the money. She went hog wild. In fact, she pinched her nerve in her back and said she couldn't work anymore. So she came home. And she was going to the spa like every other day, getting facials and spending just massive amounts of money. And the money was just dwindling and she couldn't control it. She, uh, and within a year, what was, what was left of my inheritance was just gone. And I used to just stress and stress and stress about money. It was so, I just had so much anxiety and I was like, I don't know if God's going to provide for me. Uh, well, it wasn't even that. It wasn't that I thought God wasn't going to provide for me. I wasn't thinking like that. All I could think of is this money's going to run out and I'm the only income. <laughs> uh, and when, you know, if anything happens to me, that's it, you know. And uh, she's spending like crazy, you know. I remember one time she went to a thrift store and bought a $7 print. It was really pretty ugly uh but she loved it and she said can i get it framed and i was too tolerant we never had arguments i just let her do whatever you know well she went uh to the frame shop and came home with a 600 hundred dollar frame around this thing it cost her 600 dollars, so that was the 607 dollar picture she's just out of control oh by the way she was a hoarder too and I mean like the kind you see on TV. <laughs> we had, at one point we had 10 cats who were having pee wars under the piano, which I bought the piano from my dad's inheritance money. That's the one thing I did splurge and buy myself. I had quit music as a, as a because I thought that you had to be holy to really do the anointed worship music that God had destined me to do. And I thought holiness was a matter of sanctification by works, you know. So I was working in IT, hoping that God was going to release me to do some big music ministry eventually. But as I got older, I was like now 33, 34, I realized that wasn't going to happen, you know. Anyway, that's my story with money. You know, I, I never had money growing up, and so I never knew how to handle money. I didn't know how to save I had a 401k because I knew you were supposed to do that, but uh, we cashed it out twice to cover debts. When, th when debts would get so far out of control that we weren't able to make a mortgage payment, we'd have these crises, you know, we had, and we'd have, I'd, I sold all my gear one time, my music gear to pay off debt. One time I cashed out the 401k to pay off debt. Then when she spent through all my inheritance and didn't have a job, we went and took the rest of my 401k out so we'd have a cash cushion. <laughs> and we lived in a nice house, you know, but our house, our life was just a mess. And at the time I was in a cult and uh, tithing, you know, why well, stop tithing? I, I It was starting to break down. I couldn't maintain my, the tithe. And also every week we spent several hundred dollars on groceries because my wife would make breakfast for the brothers on Sundays. I know, I'm all over the place. We, The uh, hoarding thing. We couldn't have people over to our house. We had 10 cats. We had dust everywhere, piles of papers, piles of crap she bought at garage sales. My mom's attic was full of her crap. 
her parents' basements were full of her crap. I mean, it was just ridiculous, and you couldn't even walk through our house. It was a nice house, but it was embarrassing. And it was just so much stress. And I was working that job and trying to be righteous. And, and I was trying to be holy, you know. And I'm in this cult. And yes, it was a cult. And I had to stop tithing. Well, that we had dwindled down to like 13 members of this cult. Uh, so it was a big deal when I stopped giving. Um, our money was part of the, you know, part of what was paying the rent at the meeting hall. And then uh, we started running out of money to keep doing the breakfasts. <laughs> the breakfast got leaner and leaner and the brothers started noticing, you know, what's happening to Dave? He's withdrawing. Well, I was just, I was just at my limit. You know, I had, I was running out of money, trying to keep that a, kind of a secret, really. And my wife wasn't working. She was spending all the money that we had left. And we were starting to run into some real problems. And it looked like in a matter of a couple months, I wouldn't be able to pay the mortgage. In fact, I think we did get to the point where I couldn't pay the mortgage. We skipped a month or two. And for me, that was like, you know, this is middle class stuff, but it, it was... it. It was scary and stressful, and I basically had a complete meltdown. And by our marriage fell apart. Uh, she ended up cheating on me. Uh, we let actually we left the cult. Uh, God gave me like a illumination to let me see that we were in a mess. And we left the cult, and within a couple of months. She had cheated on me with this drummer and left. And she did that because she knew she had to give me biblical grounds to divorce. She knew I wouldn't divorce her unless she did that. Our marriage was really a empty affair at that point. Um, I was working this job I hated. And I was doing it to be righteous. And trying to provide and trying to be a steward and try, you know, try always try, talking about the budget, always trying to get our money in control. And I couldn't, I couldn't control it. And so all of my righteousness and my marriage and my household all collapsed at once. Oh, and the job, by the way, they kept doing things like putting me on shifts that I'd be working 24 seven. And, uh, it just wasn't sustainable. And so I, when everything was falling apart, I was just like, I'm, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And when I, I, I left the job and I literally had no idea how I was going to survive and didn't care. Um, wife left me at about the same time, left the cult at about the same time. Now leaving the cult, I've given that story before that I didn't think that I didn't leave because I thought, oh, I finally realized what this is. I'm out. It, I, I was like, I can't take it anymore. I can't live this life. Everything I was doing, I was doing to place demands on myself uh, that I couldn't sustain trying to live righteously before God. Everything was, well, I'm a Christian. This is what I got to do. You know, the, the cult was, for me, the New Testament church life, and that was the only way you could do it. And without it, I figured... I got nothing. Even when I left, I, th I, I thought I've got nothing in my Christian life. And then my marriage fell apart. I got nothing. And then I couldn't pay my bills. I got nothing. House was foreclosed. Ended up jobless. Living in my mom's basement as a middle, you know, 34-year-old. <laughs> it was pathetic. It was really pathetic. Uh... But it's interesting when all of these burdens lifted off me, because my marriage had become an intolerable virgin burden, the cult had become an intolerable burden, the financial situation and the hoarding had become an intolerable burden, my job had become an intolerable burden, and it all fell apart at once. Uh, I didn't plan it, it just, that's how it worked. My whole life fell apart all at once. Now this is very public too. Every Christian I knew, I'd led a whole bunch of people to the Lord. They all watched this happen. You know, there's people whose spouses won't let me talk to them anymore because they think, you know, 
boy, that guy, you know, uh, to them, anybody who's justified by works in their mind would look at my situation and just go, he built his house on sand and great was the ruin of that house. And in fact, that was what I thought, you know, but, um, one time that verse was ringing in my head and God uh, showed me, told me, well, yeah, but it doesn't say he couldn't build another house. And he said, this time I'm going to build a house. And this was the first time I started seeing myself as crucified with Christ. Um, I asked the Lord to put me on the cross. I was like, I'm done. I don't want to live anymore. This, this is humiliating. Now I get it. This is first world problems. Uh, you know, my reputation and my standard of living had been shaken. Uh, but to me, it felt like losing everything. The marriage was a big deal. I didn't think you could get a divorce and be saved. <laughs> uh, that was a really hard one for me to overcome. Uh, you know, we, we were very legalistic. Looking back, we were extremely legalistic. Uh, and I was all bound up in my conscience, you know, and I was living in a prison and God, I, I, now I can see that he opened the prison doors. It, from my perspective, it looked like my life fell apart from his perspective. He's like, I'm getting you out of that prison (laughs) that you erected for yourself. Everything I did was out of obligation. I married her out of obligation. I shouldn't have married her, but we were living together and financially interdependent and we were Christians and I thought that was the thing you were supposed to do you know uh I shouldn't I that that church there were so many red flags that I didn't listen to because I thought they had the righteous way of practicing the New Testament church life according to the Bible and that was going to be my righteousness that that was how I thought I could be pleasing to God I'm in the church life with these people standing on this ground and doing this and that, you know. Anyway, and I tithed and gave faithfully, but the money, what's interesting is we always had money, but it was always gone. And I always felt guilt about it because it was our bad financial management, you know. So that was, that's my background. Uh, and what are we talking about here? We're talking about provision, when I lost the ability to do anything, and I'm in my mom's basement, I had to start taking stock of life in a different way. You know, what I realized after a little while was that I'm still healthy. I'm still alive with a roof over my head and foods available to me. And I'm not, you know, digging through dumpsters, homeless, or any other number of things that I could be, I, you know, I'm not living in Ethiopia starving. And I started taking into account God's provision. And at the same time, seeing that my righteousness had come to an end. And I had a time of peace, unlike I had had in 20 years, you know, I mean, 15 years of being a Christian for the first time I was at peace. And it was because for the first time I knew I couldn't do anything about my situation. I had no job. I had no job prospects. Oh, and I was, I I had gone back to school to finish my jazz studies degree and I wasn't going to quit, uh, to go get a job, you know, irresponsible, but I didn't care. I'm just like, I was just going to go back to my life, you know, whatever that looked like. Uh, but for the first time I had peace. Why did I have peace? Because for the first time, I wasn't taking responsibility for my righteousness and my testimony and my life, and my living arrangement, and, and doing it for God. For the first time, I was saying, I was really considering, you know what, I'm crucif- I, I need to be crucified with Christ. I didn't even know what that meant. I just had a vision one day of myself up on the cross and realizing for the first time that I deserved to be there. That we make such a big mess. You know, this is what I call big people messes. I'd made such a big people mess and damaged my testimony and what I thought damaged the gospel, so I thought. Damaged the Lord's interest and failed him in every way. And I asked him to put me up on the cross. I, and for the first time saw it, saw it as a possible deliverance. 
I didn't even know what it meant. I'm crucified with Christ. You know, now it's the center of my Christian life. Uh, I hadn't really... Yeah, so... Time began to pass, and God started putting my life back together. He showed me that the tie... He started to show me justification by faith in a deeper way, and showed me how... And this took about eight years for me to unravel all the legalism that had led me to where I had gotten, you know. And one area of legalism is the legalism around my finances. Uh, God provides for us as children because he's our father. And we're in Christ, and we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, and we're blessed with faithful Abraham. We're blessed in Christ. And we don't merit that blessing by our obedience. We enjoy it by faith. But, and, and I looked back at my life and saw that God had provided for me, even though I was under the curse of the law in my mind. I mean, w when I was tithing and everything, I was so full of anxiety because I thought that my uh, blessing was dependent on my giving. And when I had to stop tithing in order to pay our mortgage, to me, that was like, well, now what, what am I going to do? Because, you know, if I'm not tithing, God's not going to provide for me. <laughs> he provided all the way through. God never stopped providing. Yeah, we ran into problems, but like I said, they were first world problems. We were still living, you know, in the county and in the suburbs in a nice house even though we had trashed it with the hoarding. And we still had our decent cars, and, you know, to, to the rest of the world, we would have looked rich. But we had so much anxiety. And even when we missed our mortgage payments, you know, uh, we didn't die. We weren't thrown out of the house. Um, eventually, I had to sell the house. It was a short sale, you know, because uh, she was gone. <laughs> But the point is that I had been trying to hold everything together to get God to supply for me. And I thought he would, that eventually he would teach us something with our money or give us some kind of windfall where we would no longer have to worry about money again. I didn't know what it was going to look like, but I had to get rid of that anxiety. And uh, he showed me that he provided all along. Looking back, I can see he provided all along. And that is the first place of resting. Do you got to see that God's provided for you? Godliness is a meaning of great gain when it's accompanied with contentment. Contentment comes from the acknowledgement that you are provided for. Jesus said, you know, don't worry like the Gentiles about what are we going to eat, what, what's tomorrow hold and all that. He clothes the lilies. How much more will he take care of you? Oh, you have little faith, you know. And uh, I just, you know, because I could no longer do anything about my financial situation or anything in my situation, I finally had to surrender myself to God and say, I can't do anything. If, you, if you're not going to sustain this thing, it ain't going to get sustained. But see, that's when I also started to learn the faithfulness of God in my experience, because he didn't abandon me. I wanted to backslide. I tried. I tried to run away from the whole Christian life, but I couldn't. I just had to keep thinking and thinking and thinking about what had led me to this place. What was wrong with my beliefs, you know? And I had so much word in me. I'd memorized so much that I couldn't get away from it. And the Lord was speaking to me about justification and identification with Christ. Like I said, it took about eight years. Uh, but today, the way I live is just per, by a simple, pretty, pretty much daily faith. You know, when I say we're blessed, some people think that, that we're living high on the hog or something like that. No, I, I, I don't have a 401k. I don't have savings or anything. But God has supplied for me. You know, he's opened a door for me to do weddings with music for the last 10 years. And I do okay, you know. It's enough. And there's times when it's not enough and other money comes through. 
uh, you know, at the beginning of a month, I often don't know how we're going to get through, but I don't worry about it. I just, I don't have the ability to build up again what I destroyed or what God destroyed. I can't build that prison again of worrying about the future and what is, what am I going to do? And, you know, I just, I literally live day by day and have for like 10 years and it took failure. It took collapse for that to happen and for me to be released from the illusion that I was controlling things. See, I, God was actually providing for us all along, but I had the illusion that I had done it. You know, I got the job. I paid my bills. I tithed. I practiced the proper New Testament church life. And, you know, on the outside, Christians thought I was very holy, very always in the word, always with the saints, always praying, memorizing, speaking the word, gave all my money to the church, spent 35 hours a week, probably, with that church, which is one of the reasons why my marriage fell apart, you know, but besides the fact, you know, I say she was a hoarder and she was a compulsive spender, that's true, but the dissatisfaction was, while, while it was things in her, it was also the result of my own spiritual quest. She couldn't keep up with me, you know, in this church life pursuit that I was doing. And this, what I thought was a pursuit of Christ, but it was pursuing to please the brothers and be a dutiful, a, a proper member of the body of Christ, living for his expression, you know. And if you want to know more about that, I did testimony videos. I've got a testimony playlist. But until that all collapsed, I was just under all kinds of anxiety about money. And I thought God's provision was dependent on me sowing and reaping. When actually, he's always provided. And when everything fell apart, it was actually the opening of the prison doors for me to get out of my self-made prison of my works and come to fail myself into the true freedom in Christ. I didn't know I was going to land in the freedom in Christ. You know, but there came a point where it's like, I couldn't do it anymore. I can't worry about my righteousness and my testimony and my uh, witness and my right, you know, money. And it's all gone. All of it. Now what am I going to do? Am I, am I still a believer? Yeah. I can't deny that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I can't deny that that justifies me. I knew that that justified me. I knew I was a son of God and an heir. Like all these, once the effort stopped, all these scriptures that I had memorized that used to condemn me started flooding in and filling me with hope and life. And it changed. I saw that Jesus is not the hard taskmaster. I saw him as compassionate. I didn't understand his compassion before because I really didn't need it. In my mind, I was doing everything to keep this thing together. And as long as I was doing everything, to me, Jesus was a hard taskmaster. I wouldn't have articulated it that way. But I thought he demanded something of us. And I was not a compassionate person because I didn't see that the Lord was. I'd never experienced his compassion. But when I fell apart and I was so pathetic... And my friends wouldn't even talk to me. And even my atheist mother thought, oh, you loser. You know, and my wife had left me and the church called me, you know, Satan. And it was a dramatic, ugly exit. Uh, I was done. And then for the first time, I had nothing to resort to but the comforts of the Lord. And he came through and comforted me in my weakness. And in, in my need, he visited me all I can say. And so that has changed everything for me. Uh, God does provide for his children. I'm young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. But we're not holding this thing together. And as long as we think we are, it's very difficult for us to believe God. And now it's pretty easy. I don't worry that much about money. And, you know, I've had a... a financial planners come and look at my financial situation and go, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, but I'm not worried about it and I've been fine. I know we're fine. 
Um, and I'd rather have a little and be at peace. Have a roof over my head, you know. I've lost everything. It's not that bad. You can lose it all and gain it all again, and it doesn't affect who you are in Christ. And once you realize that, um, that life has seasons and it's messy and you go through things, and then you start meeting other people that you wouldn't have talked to before, but now you're brother in arms with people like that who whose lives are messy, you realize, oh my gosh, most people's lives are totally a mess. Once they get old enough to make their big people mistakes, and you realize, okay, it's not as bad as I thought. It's bad, but... Uh, the why, the reason it was so humiliating was because I thought that I had to be the prince of righteousness. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm just me. And God says that's okay. You know, he loves me. He gave himself for me. And now um, he's using me, you know. Praise God. People are getting saved. People are getting set free. I get emails all the time of things happening in people's lives because of the messages and stuff i don't take credit for that but i'm thankful that everything i went through ended up not being uh ended up not being in vain you know uh it's all for a purpose so this was supposed to be about financial provision i didn't know what to say about it god provides for you be content recognize his blessing recognize what you do have and if you're in a hard spot, it's a season, you know. He will provide for you. If you're alive, if you're sitting here able to listen to a message on a phone, you're in a pretty good spot. The fact that you're even able to hear a message like this means that your life must have some kind of stability into it. You're not digging through the trash in some dumpster, you know. And even if you were, uh, he'd still provide for you one way or another. I can't say how he's going to do it for everybody or what it'll look like, but I can say, you know, try not to have a certain standard of living that you have to keep and maintain. That's uh, a problem when you expect that it has to be a certain way and try not to look at your job as your source. You know, it is good to have a job. It is good to have money coming in that you can spend, but God's your source. And if that job goes today there's something else tomorrow you know he'll he always opens doors he always brings you into new situations that you you're not prepared to even imagine i would have never thought that i'd be playing piano at weddings you know it's just it's not something i dreamed about it's not something i it just sort of happened uh and that's what he does you know he he, he will provide for us all the way through and he'll get us through this life and we need to learn to rely on him. But it's a rest. And it's real. once you realize you can't do anything. And that's one of the great things about COVID that I think it did for quite a lot of people. I know a lot of people who were in absolute peace through the COVID when they shut everything down and people lost their jobs. Because they had to watch God provide for them. They're still here, you know. Uh, they knew that they weren't responsible for their financial situation anymore. And that's actually a good place to be. To recognize that, okay, I'm totally dependent on God right now. If he doesn't do anything, I'm, I'm, you know. And for me, it all comes down to that. Is the Christian life really what they say in the Bible, or is it not? Does it work, or doesn't it? And you make a decision to believe the word. Okay, uh, I don't know if this is going to help anybody or not, but I th thought I'd just speak from my heart and my experience about it. All right, take care.